Hello everyone, I'm Robert Icy. Most of you will know me, but for you that don't, I'm the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. And welcome to the Mindclap podcast. Hello everyone, I'm Robert Icy, the UK's number one unconscious mind therapist. And I want to start this by saying thank you all very, very much for joining me on my podcast and the journey. And I hope you enjoyed it. There were some amazing, deep stories in there, you know, and big opening stories. Um, but first of all, this podcast is going to be showing you what all of these people done the same, unconsciously. Not the conscious, um, the pattern, not the, not the content of what they, that they thought, but the unconscious process in which they all thought the same. So, but first of all, I need to educate you a little bit on the reticular activation system and that everything gets made twice. So I'm going to start off with a visualisation process for you to understand um, so you can run through this with me and understand it at a deeper and a, a more sophisticated level. Um, so, first of all, everything gets made twice. Whatever room you're in now, if you're in the car listening to this, you know, if you're in your kitchen, if you're in your front room, in your bedroom, whatever, look around the room and see if you can find me anything that never started as a thought. Now, there is one exception to this, except for what comes from nature and the earth in its original form. So except for the trees, plants, cats, dogs, wind, rain, sand, snow, all that sort of jazz, yeah? Except for what comes from nature and the earth in its original form, see if you can find anything that never started as a thought. Exactly. There's fuck always there, there's nothing. You know, everything got made twice. Everything in that room you're in now, first started as a thought, as a vision inside a human's mind before it was created as a thing. You know, you're wearing faults, you're sitting on a fault. You drive a fault. You know, there's not a, there's not a fireplace tree, there's not a sofa tree, there's not a shoe tree. You know, they were all started, first of all, inside a human's brain, from the beginning of mankind till today, inside the mind is a vision. Now look outside the building. I'll give you the hour of London. If you're in America, you can have New York City, the skyline of New York, yeah, inside and outside every building in Manhattan. See if you can find me one thing that never come from nature and the earth in its original form that never started as a thought in a human's brain. You can look at the windows, the glass, you know, the, the buildings, the screw, wh wh the, the roads. Everything gets made twice, and including you. So if you look at Miami Dali, for instance, at the age of 18, he wins the Olympics in Rome, and he says, I am the greatest. I'm the next heavyweight champion in the world. I'm the greatest bugs this world's ever seen. Do you like me um, American accent? Saw in it. So, Miami Dali, anyway, he, um, when I studied Ali, I got deep into studying Ali, and he said when he went out running, he'd be visualising being a world champion. When he'd be skipping in the gym, he'd be visualising, I'm like a WBO, buying his mum and dad a house, you know, m moving around the ring, dancing. You know, when he was on the punch bag, he'd be visualising. And he said, I've visualised myself as a world champion since I was 12. So the time Miami Dali got to the age of 18 when he fought for the Olympics, he was the only fighter in that ring that didn't want to win the Olympics. He didn't want to win, he expected to. He was visualising right through there to being the greatest boxer of all time. I am the greatest. He felt so confident in saying it, everyone thought he was delusional and fucking mad. Albert Einstein says, stupid people say there's a thin line between genius and madness. Stupid people say that because they sound mad to stupid people because they're visionaries. You know, they see things first, and people don't know how they're going to get there, so they think they're nuts, but they tell you, I'm the greatest. I'm going to be the next heavyweight champion in the world. And which you become, you know, if you ask any boxer who's the greatest, you know, they're going to say Ali. So I want you to understand that not only do thoughts become things, you become what you think about. And this podcast shows you that, you know, what you predominantly think about, you become. So the next part I want to go to f show you some science behind it, some scientific evidence that this is the case. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activating system. Now the reticular activating system is a group of neurons at the bottom of the brain that works as a filtering, a filtering system. And this is the, the filter that when you want to go and buy a car, when you fancy a new motor and everywhere you go, you see this C-class Merc or something and you fancy it. Everywhere you go, you start to notice it more and more and more. You go up the shopping centre, you see three in a car park. You go around your mum's house, there's two on a neighbour's drive or, you know, wherever you go, you're driving down the motorway, you start seeing them drive past you. Everywhere you go, notice this car because you've shown your RES system what you're interested in. It doesn't understand what you want or what you don't want. It just understands what you focus on is what you want. 
and it will show you more evidence of it. So you'll start to see more cars. You'll finally get that car, you'll buy the car. For the first month, you still see them, you feel buzzing. Got your new car, the second month's coming more, a bit more mundane now, you know, it's becoming that car. And by the third month, it's just your car like the other car was. Yeah, you find your McDonald's on the seat, you know, like your rappers and stuff, yeah, it just becomes the car. You stop seeing the car. Then you start visualising a Range Rover. You start seeing Range Rovers everywhere. A few years later, you get yourself a Range Rover. You don't even see C-classes anymore. Your brain deletes them. So the RES system deletes, distorts, and generalises information and only picks out what you are interested in. So, so first of all, visualisation is a skill. You have to practise this visualisation to bring your RES system into alignment with you, for you to, to, to work out all the information um, for what you need. The RES system runs two million pieces of data a second. Two fucking million pieces of data a second. You can only run seven. Me and you and our conscious mind can only run seven pieces of data a second. Then we have to distort, delete, and generalise information. So while you're looking at me now, if you were to actually look at every little mark on my top, my Anki, like the, the marks behind you, the wood, every single little groove in this, yeah, every little air on my head. If you were trying to take in every piece of information that your eyes can see simultaneously, your mind would melt down. It'd probably explode, yeah? You can't take all them pieces of data in. We have to distort, delete, and generalise information. This is where we can get problems in life. But anyway, understanding your filter is going to allow you to work in alignment and get what you want. So if you ever, if your missus has been pregnant before, yeah, um, everywhere you go, you start seeing pregnant women. You drive past the cafe, you see mums sitting outside in the cafe, see women breastfeeding, you start noticing fucking buggies and the SMA gold in the garage, you start noticing what aisle it's going to be in. Like everywhere you go, you start seeing babies and, you know, baby related things. Your mum will come in and go, hello, boy, I, I guess what? I bumped into Julie today. Her mum's sister's nieces, squirrels, had twins. Yeah, there must be saying in the wall. Everywhere I go, I keep hearing it because now your mum's RES system has started to focus on babies because she's going to be a nan. So I want you to be aware of this. And looking back through the podcast, that all these people were highly focused on what they wanted. Tom Zanetti, for instance. I got my money right. Uh, I was like working fucking every hour again to try and get everything up to scratch. I managed to do it. And then I bought, um, <clears throat> then I ripped off that fucking Ferrari, did I? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, what happened now? Yeah. How much you lose on that one? Is that a fortune? Oh, bro. So I, um, we were DJing for Conor McGregor's after party in Manchester. And it was a really good night. It's like a proper rock star thing. Like I remember I'd, um, at the, that same night I was DJing for Conor McGregor, but then I also had to DJ in Ministry of Sound in London. So, and because there were no trains on, and because of the You've time space, down. I had to get a private jet. So we, yeah. so we fighted all night at Conor McGregor's gaff. They've got the jet straight to Ministry of Sound, set it oh, off shit. in London, got the jet back to Manchester. Come the next day, I had my pal's Ferrari, brand new Berlinetta, um, F12 Berlinetta. It only had a fucking thousand miles on the clock. It was, a, I think there was only 20 of them made. And I'm driving back. I've not, I've not, I'd been to sleep. I've not, I don't want yeah. to drive or I want driving like a dickhead. Yeah. I wasn't used to driving this car and this car like a fucking dragster, mate. Just I put my foot down gone. Um, to go. As I was taking it back to him, it uh, spun out, hit a curb, gone to the other side, flipped over, and I ended up doing it about, f I, I just remember in slow motion, like I put my head down, I had bird it cow me at the same time, I grabbed her, put her head down, I knew it was gonna flip. Oh, so I'm like, it's gone like slow motion, but as it's gone slow motion, I've seen all the like the dollar signs, I'm like, nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> So we skidded like 50 feet, <coughs> smoke started coming out of bonnet. Oh, so man, I had you to make that call. Ah, oh, bro, so this is what I'm saying. So I've, I've, I've jumped out, I've managed, the, the roof crushed in, I've checked she was all right, I've booted the door off, um, ran around to pull her out, and then I just rang my pal, and um, my pal's like a proper bit of a boy, you know, yeah. in, in his, um, it was his car, and I said, I said, look, I've just wrote your car off. Anyway, fuck off, Tom, stop messing around. I went, no, no, honestly, it's on its roof. I've just brought your car off, mate. <laughs> and he went, right, I'm in a meeting, I'll call you back. So I went, all right, no problem. And yeah, I just had to pay off because it was, um, it cost 300 grand, bro. So I managed to get myself, wow. I managed to get myself to a good place again. In the back end. And literally, I wasn't even driving like a dick, I slipped on some oil. So that was it. Oil, because it was so powerful. Yeah, they just spin the back too. Oh, bro, it, it's just got, so. Your bags, car, mate. Yeah, but I, had to, but I had to give everything up again. That was it. I had to give all my money back. He always visualised getting his clubs up and running. 
No matter what he'd been through, I mean, he lost his, his missus in a car crash. It's tragic, you know. People look at Tim, um, Tom and think, you know, oh, he's got the good life. You know, he's on the jets, the Rolexes, the cars. I mean, that guy worked for every single penny he got. The, the music is the side thing for him. Yeah? People don't realise that. Um, but he told, me, he told me off camera that when he was a kid in a school, that he used to visualise himself being the best rapper. You know, and then years later it manifests itself. He's a platinum-selling artist. He's a visionary. He sees it in his mind. He's, he's dropping some banger tracks lately with Silky. You know, I love Silky. Um, he's done a wicked track with Silky. Um, he's got a few other tracks out with um, Dappy and that, you know. He's doing really well, you know. He's still flying. He's still releasing great tracks. And he's still visualising. Like, he's, he's, rest he's got a, um, a nightclub called Doll's House. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful venue. The way, he, you know, he's created it inside is amazing. And, you know, Tom's got other goals that he's still visualising and he talks to all these people about visualisations. Every single one see themselves where they want to be before they get it, you know? Tom had been bankrupt three times, you heard. And the one thing that I learned from Tom Zanetti's story is that the human brain and body is designed to deal with anything that hits you, that you can overcome it. And I think he's a, a, an amazing example of that, you know, just getting up and going again, getting up and going again, going through the pain for show, get up and going again. And he has to, he said, there's always found a reason for his son or whatever it was to, to create a vision that they had to see him as a certain role model. But there's always a vision behind it. Wayne Lineker, look at his REA system and the visualisation that first kicked in. How did the, um, the visualisation of... Um, bars come about because I know you went from the market st stalls and then next thing you was a yeah. uh, bar right now in um, Tenerife. I mean, how did that, how did you create that? How did you, how did, how did change come about? Now, Wayne was lucky because he kept asking himself, his brother, his brother was um, obviously a legend for England, Gary Lineker, a great player. And Wayne said, the markets were going down, markets were all going down a pan, what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? Um, I need to make some money. What can I do off a Ma family name? Because it's my name as much as my brother's. I mean, my brother was like Wayne Rooney in a day. He, you know, he's, he's smashed it. He's doing amazing. What can I do on a Lineker name? And he said, I kept asking myself that. And he said, one morning I went down the cafe and I'm walking down the cafe, got to get the bacon rolls for all the chaps. He said, I was walking along, all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, a vision. Hit him, smack in the face. He said, I see it, Lineker's bar, I see like the bar, I see this round window, I see all the pictures of my brother up on the wall around the bar. And he said, I just stopped dead in my tracks. And Wayne, he says to me every time he goes back up to where, where he's from, up in the Midlands, that he goes to the market and he can take you to the exact um, paving slab where he, where he stood when this vision hit him. And he said, I couldn't get it out of my head. He kept seeing it and seeing it. So what he was doing is, unconsciously, he was visualising um, Lineker's bar, yeah, again and again and again. His girlfriend said, do you want to come over to Spain, blah, blah, blah. So he shoots over to Spain to stay with her mum for a week. He's looking around all these bars. You've heard the podcast, so I'm going to cut it short. You know, when he sees the round window, the guy gets him to the, gets him to the, um, to the viewing. And he said, I was outside and I see it. And I went, I want it, take it. And the guy said, you only looked inside. He said, I'll take it. He said, I knew it was the bar. He said, it had the round window. He said, it was the only bar in Tenerife that had a round window. So... He said, when I walked in, it was the exact bar. He said, I had to move the bar from the right-hand side and put it into the centre. He said, but the layout was exactly what I see in my mind. It was the exact same bar. I was blown away. <laughs> like, literally, I saw this place in my vision. How did that feel? Like, I, I could take you to the same tile I was standing on when I had the vision in, in the, the market. market, yeah. And then the rest, rest is history. You know, Wayne's a millionaire. He's had, um, I think, up tw over 12, I think it's about 12 Lineker bars around Europe. Um, people have even copied him in Thailand. Um, and now he owns one of the biggest, or probably the, my favourite nightclub in Ibiza called O Beach, yeah? It was Ocean Beach, they've changed it to O Beach. Um, and it's still doing amazing, you know? They're about to, you know, they've been visualising the guys and they're seeing it in Dubai. This is all getting created, you know? They're seeing O Beach and now they're visualising it getting made in Dubai. And now they're seeing the Dubai version of that in their head and they've already planned it and it's going to be up and running. So, you know... Again, the same, st the same story repeats itself. Successful people visualising, seeing their goals, seeing the outcome. The RES system kicks in and starts to generalise, um, not generalise, it starts to 
use two million pieces of data a second organising your brain from all the knowledge that you had from when you was a kid to today of every single bit of academic knowledge, um, emotional knowledge, it's looking for it, it's scanning it and you don't even know it's doing it. It's working out the information for you to get there and it's done unconsciously. You don't know. So it shows you have to just visualise your, your goals and let go. Don't try to figure out how to fucking get there because the minute you fucking change your vision from what you want and you start looking at the journey and what you've got to overcome, you're shifting your filter. You start looking at over things you need to overcome, your filter starts to find you more things to overcome. And now they feel like an hurdle. They feel like they're in your way. Where if you visualise the goal, the end goal, and just fucking stay focused to it and let go and not worry about it, which people find more difficult than not, is to just visualise and then get on with your day and wait for the information to come to you. It will come to you. So, from Wayne Lineker, we had Dame Kelly Holmes. Now, Dame Kelly Holmes was interesting because, you know, for one, she's a dame. She's amazing, a lovely lady, um, very focused, um, very regimented, you know. It was the army, and, you know, that's why she made the army so well. Um, she likes, uh, you know, you can see her on her Instagram now. She's got a daily routine. She loves routine. Some people love routine. And you go into barracks and it's just straight away, it's like it's discipline, a, you know, it's straight into in there. Get a little liar, you know, <laughs> right up there, you just like, oh, you know, you kind of don't move. And when you're a young kid, you know, if you're used to kind of gobbing up a bit, as soon as you're in there, you're just like, you know, because yeah. you know you're in trouble. You know, you know. But it was just, I loved it, I really loved it. She said when she was at school that she didn't like school, she hated it. I think she had to pass a couple of exams to make the army. That was the only reason she really, she went for them. So she was visualising being in the army and she also visualised being an Olympic gold medalist from a young age. Now, no one talked about visualisation, she just done that. And as luck would have it, she, you know, first of all, become a soldier. I think they're like 10 years in the British army. It was a long time anyway. And I think she was nearly 30, wasn't she, when she ran for, run, when she ran for England? She was, she was beating men in races and stuff, and, you know, they, they, she started winning championships, and, you know, she got picked for the, the squad. So she'd become a soldier, she worked her way up as a soldier, and now she's a, um, an Olympic gold medalist, two times Olympic gold medalist, broke the record, you know? She's a world record holder. Um, Again, seeing herself constantly winning it, running the races. She'd see herself visualise how she was going to run on a day before she got there on a the day. She'd be practising in her head how it was going to look, how the race was going to go. You know, we all hear stories of Conor McGregor visualising how he's going to knock someone out and then he goes and makes it twice. Remember, guys, all this stuff ain't just happened for luck. All this bullshit, you know, what's meant to be won't pass me by. It's a load of fucking nonsense. You have to create your own fucking luck. And it ain't luck, it's creation. It's fucking creation. This is what human beings do. We create. First gets created as a thought, then gets created outside of our reality. And as I might have heard this in the podcast, I might have said this a few times about a crocodile. Two million years ago, two million years ago, a crocodile was in a fucking swamp. What did it do? Kill, sleep, eat, mate, reproduce. Kill, sleep, eat, mate, reproduce. What's it doing today, two million years later? It's still in a swamp. It kills, sleeps, eats, mates, reproduce. It's thick as shit. It ain't got a creative mind. It ain't got a fucking RAS system. We have, yeah? We are creators. Don't think your academic intelligence is what you are. You're first and foremost a creator, and we've lost our ability to visualise, yeah? We're, most of us, through school, become academic, which means we look at the problems and how, how, how to overcome them. You know, most people, kids, when they leave school, are scared of picking a career, yeah? Because the school system teaches how not to make mistakes how not to do something, how not to fail our exams. The time we leave school, we're full of fear. And, you know, as a little kid, you ask any five-year-old kid, six-year-old kid, what do you want to be? They're full of vision. I want to be a spaceman. I want to, be an, I want to own an ice cream van, my little son used to say to me. I want to be a professional footballer. You know, they leave school, it's like their life's drained out of them because the academic intelligence has taken away our visualisation, our visualisation skills. We are first and foremost visionaries. You don't need to learn this. You can do it. You just have to apply it. There's no, oh, I have to learn to visualise what you're talking about. You can close your eyes and remember what your mum and dad look like, can't you? You can remember what your TV looks like in the front room if you close your eyes. You all can fucking visualise it. It ain't something you've got to learn. It's something that you're born to do. You've been taught how not to do it. What did Picasso say? We're born artists. We're taught how not to become artists as we get older. That's the fucking truth. So, visualisation, I said, is a skill. We've got to keep practising it. Visualise your goal as an outcome. Don't try to figure out how to get there. 
Then, and only then, two million pieces of data a second kicks in to generate the information throughout your day, throughout your weeks, throughout your months, for you to get what you want. And this is science. This ain't no hocus pocus shit. You know, people like the law of attraction. I love the law of attraction. It's a fact. It's the law of the universe. But people go, I believe in it. I don't believe in it. Well, the RAS system is science. It's a fucking fact. And it runs in alignment with the law of attraction. So if you don't believe in it, it don't fucking matter. You've only got to apply this strategy. You've only got to apply the visualizations each day of focusing on what you want and not focusing on how to get there. And within a month, you will start to feel and see results. Um, so moving on to the next guest. Let's go to Johnny Nelson. Now, Johnny Nelson was an amazing, an amazing character for me. Um, we're talking about Johnny. It was a little bit different. He wasn't a visionary. He ate his fucking boxing. He said he was shit. He said, I was so shit when I started boxing at 13. Brendan Ingle wouldn't let me fight till I was 17. The other kids in the gym would say, you've got to come and see this kid spar. He's fucking useless. He said, they won't sat behind me back. They'd be standing right in front of me face. He said, I only went because my mates went. I didn't really care about boxing. So he said, if I can become world champion, you all can. Anyone can. And at the beginning, I thought, yeah, yeah. But as you hear the story unfold, fuck me, it was amazing. And remember, I only had 13 amateur fights. 13? And I won three. So I had 13 <laughs> amateur fights. <laughs> really? I won I mean, three. I was proper shit. I and to... people told me that to my face. They didn't say it behind my back like you'd be doing, saying, oh, fuck, good night, shit. <laughs> exactly. They'd actually say, you just shit, you. I'm like, Straight right. to your face. Yeah, man, that's how they did it. Property face. I remember you said something about when you first started, you was 14, and Brendan never let you fight till you was what? 17. 17. I was that bad. Really, John? Yeah, I was that mad. bad. You know, he's um, he was amazing. Brendan Ingle, I love to meet the late um, Brendan Ingle, you know, the Sheffield gym, absolute legend, the fellow. And he's seeing John what he never seen himself. John lost his first three or four fights as an amateur and a pro, I believe. Um, but Brendan Ingle sees something in him, like this determiner, he just kept going. And he taught John how to be confident, because he wasn't confident in his ability. John said, Johnny Nelson said to me that when he become British champion, I didn't think I was good, I just thought the other guy was shit. That's why I thought I could win. So I wasn't confident in my ability, if, if you get what he's saying, he's confident in the that, you know, the other guy was shit. So then he, he had the vision that he could win and he created it twice. When he won the European title, he said, I never thought I was great. I thought the other guy was shit. Brendan's telling me I'm better all the time. I'm better than this. And I believed it and, you know. But he said, when I got to WB, I think it was WBC, I think he drew. He said, I should have won that fight. He said, it's a fucking disgrace. He said, but all of a sudden I thought, oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to get caught out here. I'm not a world champion, I'm not really good enough for that. He still didn't see it in himself. And later on in the podcast, you know, if you listen to it, you would hear the part where he says, when he's been sparring this French champion and he's up and punching him around the ring, you know, like slipping these shots, having fun with him, getting paid to spar him. And he's walking out, standing at this shit hotel and he's crossing the road in, in, um, in Toulouse in France. And as he crosses the road, the French guy goes, Johnny! He said, I look round and it's this French champion. I go, Johnny, I'll see you tomorrow. And he said, I stood in the rain looking at him. And he was getting a beautiful limousine, you know, back in the early 90s, limos with the governors. And he's getting this big, massive limousine. And his beautiful girlfriend, beautiful bird, beautiful wife, whatever she was. And he said, the picture was wrong. He said, I'll just beat this guy up. I could beat this guy up with, with one arm, yeah? And he said, I'm never going to lose again. That's when he created the vision. And he created the commitment to himself, that I'm never going to lose again. And he sees himself as the world champion, undefeated, like, from that point on. He went on to win the WBO, and he never lost again from that day, by the way. He had the, he's still got the world record for the WBO, holding the WBO belt for 13 defences at Cruiserweight. No one's ever beat that to this day. It's amazing. So, you know, I've got to give um, Johnny Nelson some credit because, but it, with Johnny, it wasn't that he visualized and believed in himself. So this shows about visualizations with our kids and with our children, with our friends. We can help them. If we see good in people, we should be fucking telling them. 
because people could become world champions who can't fucking fight and can't box. And they learn the skills and in the end they, they get to see the vision, they get to see what the other person's been telling them and that's it. Everything changes. So, you know, another one like Johnny Nelson who wasn't a visionary and I felt was quite unconfident actually in his abilities and he even said in the podcast that he could have been better if he did have more confidence himself was Wayne Bridge. And with confidence, in your like sort of looking at, talking about confidence over the grid, you see a lot of, because um, it can be the difference to make a player or break a player, can't it? You know, that, that sort of mindset, do you think, of being Yeah, definitely, like you can have, you cannot have enough confidence that you don't make it. You can be overconfident that you don't make it. You know, there's yeah. definitely a balance as well. Um, I'm definitely not one of them players that add overconfidence. No, Sometimes fair. I wish I had more because I feel like I probably could have done more. Um, I take take my hat off to those people that have got so much confidence that they just walk out there and they just bowl, bowl. around. Like, and, and they do it as well. You look at Ronaldo, just bowls around and he just does it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, love, I love to see it. Um, but it, it, can affect, it can affect people in so many different ways. ways yeah. I mean, he was a lovely, lovely man. Really nice man, Wayne Bridge. Um, but he, he didn't seem confident in a lot of his abilities, you know, and he said it was the managers that see good in him. And the managers would even tell the other players, look, he's unconfident. Go and tell him that he's amazing, tell him that he's good. And he never knew to a few months ago, I forgot who the manager was who, who was saying it, that, you know, he had to put this on an interview, that I used to have to tell him, to, the players to tell Wayne how good he is and he's amazing, to build his confidence. And he said it made him feel emotional. Um, and that's amazing because he's an amazing player. Um, but it could be the difference from being even a better player if he had the confidence and the vision. So his visions, they weren't really his own, they were other people's visions that they were seeing in him that helped get him to that level. But, and and he, I think he's, he even said in the podcast that if he visualised, if he'd have seen it in himself more, he would have been better than what he is today. So don't miss that opportunity, guys. Don't fucking miss that. You're a born visualizer. Fucking use it, yeah? Close your eyes, disconnect from the world and visualize your goals. It ain't daydreaming. Daydreaming is something if you just think of a good thing and then you don't think about it again. That's a fucking daydream. But if you close your eyes and visualize the same vision every day, every day, it's no longer a daydream. It bec you become a visionary. It starts to kick in, it starts to manifest itself. You start seeing signs. The RES system starts showing you signs that you are worthy, that you can do this. You are capable, you are confident, you are powerful. You'll start seeing signs as, as the months go on, you'll get more confident, more confident. Look, I'm dyslexic with ADHD. I left school at 14. I never took any exams at school. I never went sixth form college or university. But I pay people to work for me that fucking did. So what's the intelligence? Yeah? You're a fucking creator. That's what your intelligence is. Be who you want to be, yeah? But the sad thing is a lot of people don't know what they fucking want. Don't know who they want, what they want to be. What's their passion? I don't know. Oh, I like playing golf. Oh, that's it. What else? what else? I don't know. People don't know. And if you're at home listening to this and you don't know, start fucking hunting. Dig inside yourself. Do some soul searching. Get out a pen and paper. Write down, if, if you can't do big goals, write down a month's goal. Two months goal. A week fucking goal. Six month goal. Get a year goal. Get a three year goal and a five year goal. I love the three and fives. They really pull me. Um, not a lot of people can hit 10 year goals. I can see me 10 years, but you have to work at that, you know? But it doesn't matter if you just get a month goal, a week goal, whatever. Start visualizing, but keep raising your fucking standards. You know, when you get to a goal, you've got to visualize another goal. You can't be content. People go, I should be happy. Why should you be happy? Because you've got a nice house, you've got a nice car, and you've got the kids. Of course, you're not going to be fucking happy if you ain't raising your standards and getting going for a better ass and a better car or a fucking a, a bigger business or, help, or going out and helping people and touching people to make their lives better. You know, whatever it is, you have to create another level of visualization. Um, some of the other, the other guests who didn't realize they visualized my good friend Jamie O'Hara, you know, I brought up with his family in Bermondsey, um, lovely people. Um, I always had a drive as a young boy, just I wanted to be a football player, you know, that was my dream, um, to, to be a, a player in the Premiership. Um, I wanted to play for Tottenham and I always visualised from, from the start as a young kid of uh, having the drive and the determination to make it as a footballer and I was very lucky that I had the talent, which helped, yeah. you know, I, I was a talented uh, uh, young lad. Jamie never knew what he was doing. 
I'll talk Jamie about visualizations in a, a deeper level and the reticular activating system. I showed him a few videos one day and he sat there like, at my retreat, I've got a retreat called Holistic Retreat out in Spain and he sat there with like tears and I thought he had a tear in his eyes, but he never, his eyes just went glassy. And he was just sort of like staring like, I see the penny drop. And what's the matter, Jamie, you all right? He went, yeah, yeah, he went, all makes sense. Well, fuck my career up and it all makes sense. And we had a good chat about it, we sat down. And he said, I was visualizing playing for Tottenham my whole life and playing for a premiership player. I knew I was going to be one. I told everyone I'm going to be one. But because I visualised it every fucking day, I never knew what I was doing. I never knew it was a skill, Rob. I never knew it was something that, you know, I, I, this was what's going to fucking make me. He said, people used to go to me, Jamie, how'd you, how'd you become a premiership player? And he'd go, I ain't being flash. I just used to see myself playing for Tottenham and I'd become a premiership player. That was it. He said, but they, I feel like they think I'm being flash. I don't know what else to fucking say. That's all I've done. See myself playing for Tottenham and I fucking play for Tottenham. End of story. He said, but what happened is when I got on the pitch, as you hear in the podcast, as he got, as he got into the team, I mean, not on the pitch, as he got into the team, he said it all started to go wrong. Why? Because he never raised his fucking standards. He said, I weren't training to make the team anymore. I was training just to sustain my fitness to play Saturday. I weren't visualising being a better player, which I should have been. Now I've made Tottenham, I should have been visualising scoring 30 goals this season. I should have been visualising making the England first team. He said, but I fucking never. What happened? He got caught up in the here and now because he didn't understand the process. And he started getting injured, getting seen, coming out of nightclubs, the fucking managers. Harry Redknapp got the fucking pox of him and he fucked his career up, as he says in these words. And... And from that day, it was amazing. A few years ago, we started visualising. He's done a little bit for Sky as a pundit uh, and um, talk sport on radio. He was doing a little bit on there, presenting, just like coming on as a guest um, in the morning show. And he said, Rob, I want to visualise being the fucking next, you know, next big name up in the football industry on Sky and, and on the radio. He went, you know, that's, that's, that is it. And he started visualising it. And I can't even tell you how fast it started coming in. Even I was just sitting back a month or two after the retreat, it started getting more fucking... You know, more, but it was, it was good because when he was on talk sport, he started talking about me and what we spoke about, and I think people gravitated to it. The fuck me, wow, he can talk deep, you know, he understands visualization. He's, he was, and, and I think it opened their eyes to a lot of people listening into Jamie and, you know, how deep he actually is um, and how knowledgeable he is into it, you know, because he's lived it and he's seen both sides of it. And, you know, he's visualising now, like, Sky's giving him more work. He's flying at Sky as a pundit. He's got, he's got his own show on a Friday. He's always on the Alan Brazil show. He's going to become the wheel now. He's going to probably take over from Alan Brazil one day. Um, and everything he's visualised, he's created again. You know, I want to be more on talk sport. Yeah. I want to be presenting, you know, a show on the breakfast show, which yes. is the big one. You know, I want to, instead of doing the Sky stuff, I want to be on the Super Sunday, you know, yeah, doing, yeah. Not presenting that, like Gary Lineker. Yeah, you, know, like you have to keep pushing yourself to, to you know, set goals, to not feel comfortable. I, the, the worst state that I could ever put myself in now is that comfortable state. Yes. As soon as I got comfortable in life was when things started to stop going well. And that's, what, that's his new visualisations. And this is, he wants me to help him with the FA eventually, helping players to visualise and create new, new levels of success. And, you know, new players going into the game. You know, players that are in the game and leaving. Their wives, maybe. How, they, how do they cope with it? You know, there's... We have to keep raising our standards, and I think that's a good one to prove to you. You have to raise your fucking standards. You can never be content, yeah? It's not that you never be happy, because no one's ever going to be happy doing the same thing. How did define boredom, doing the same thing again and again and again and again, right? Because fucking boring. We always need to fucking raise our standards, so that's really important for you guys to take that away with you from out, for, for, you know, through the podcasts.